Trekkie Dave here, and you guys are in for a treat today. Unchained Trekkie Dave. I'm alone in the house. Here, hold on a second. Let me shut this up. My wife is at an appointment and the kids are out. The only person here with me is my loyal dog. Look at him. He's even using a neck thing. Hey, Farley. Hi. Say hello. Hello. So anyways, so, so a treat today. Okay. So, um, ooh, there is DeForest Kelly, Dr. McCoy, the greatest, uh, or one of the gents of the net or of the uh, greatest generation. And, uh, my favorite character, Dr. McCoy of, uh, of the original series. What else I got here? And then, uh, oh, I got a, uh, Captain's Log Trekkie Day book because because that is awesome too and um, so yeah so today is going to be oh yeah and there's my uh, there's my uh, uh, next generation ins insignia there uh, important stuff here um, oh and this is always kind of cool whenever I look at this guy when I'm about to do a podcast I feel like the Joker is uh, given me the stage he's given me permission here to so he's really not that bad of a uh, psychotic murderous uh, crazy person um, so anyways so today I'm gonna touch upon I'm not gonna do like a review exactly of a specific thing or a deep dive on a specific thing like I did with you know kind of with uh, you know Black Widow and especially Star Trek the motion picture and what I plan to do with the next generation or sorry the last Jedi soon um my plan today um and since i'm alone here i'll just do it as quickly as i can here um but my plan today actually i'll start with a quiz here's a exciting quiz what do five of these things all have in common but one of them doesn't have it hmm. okay so let me just show you okay so okay so these five things Okay, so we got Moonraker, we have The World Is Not Enough, Batman 89, and The Wrath of Khan, and The Lower Decks. So what does all of these things have in common? Any guesses? Okay, I'll tell you. They're all fun, okay? And what does, what does one of them not have in common? Any guess? Okay, here we go. One of them, right there, that guy there, he's new. Wow, look at that, the only new one. And these ones, huh, let's take a look. These ones are all super old. Like Batman 89 obviously came out in, well, 89. Wrath of Khan came out in 82. And then 90s for The World Is Not Enough. I just love that movie. And then Moonraker, of course, was 79. And then this I'll touch upon at the end. There's something important I want to tell you about this and this. Um, the basics of it is um, these are two of the greatest novels about the makings or of creators. This one, even though it's not written by him, is about how Nicholas Meyer became involved in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. And in my opinion, saved Star Trek. I don't believe that there is a Star Trek today without the great Nicholas Meyer. And of course this is Gene Roddenberry and, and how he created Star Trek, the original series, still the greatest Star Trek TV series of all time. Okay, so let's, um, let's begin. Get it set, sorry, I'm by myself other than my dog and I don't trust him to do, to do sensitive work like this. He's got no actual digits, just pause. Here's my gist, and this is not a controversial opinion at all. And I want to make sure, I hope when I say this, I'm saying it um, um, with as much respect as possible. So, um, I screw it. I'll just plow away. Modern movies generally suck. And I think they're all affected by a similar thing. And you know what? It's kind of funny I'm saying this because when I first started my channel, oh, I don't want that to be shown, sorry. When I first started my channel, um, my goal was to be very positive, you know? Um, and so this is what I'm about to say today. 
not everybody will agree with me. Um, Band of Menace might, but nobody else will agree with me possibly. But it's a strong opinion I've had about modern movie making for 20 years, basically since um, Batman Begins. Christopher Nolan took over Batman Begins. And especially with the Daniel Craig Bond films, but also New Trek. Um, yeah, you know what? It's pretty much affected everything. The only thing it hasn't affected, in my opinion, is Marvel. Because Marvel is fun as hell. And I find it very funny how that's not what people seem to want these days, or at least that's what the mainstream tells us we don't want, because I see countless criticisms of Marvel. Oh, it's an amusement park. Oh, it's not that fun. Why can't they take themselves more seriously? Why are they joking all the time? I don't know, because it's funny, because people laugh, because they want to be entertained, and they're tired of everything being some dire tragedy where the whole galaxy is freaking blowing up. Something like that. I mean, to me, I respect Kevin Feige beyond belief because he stood his ground and he said screw to those critics. But I do find it amusing that he has to even defend that. That we live in a world where being positive and being fun and entertaining somebody is like this big deal. It's like it's the one that stands out and we need to call them out because, you know, they're not taking this comic book stuff nearly serious enough. Like, you know, we need to, you know, I don't know, have mass graves or something. Like, it's just, it's just such a bizarre concept to me. And every time I see that, I just roll my eyes and I'm like, what exactly are you saying? Like, is this idea now of what entertainment is supposed to be so ingrained in us as a society that we just can't freaking take our shoes off and relax for five minutes? I mean, I remember when I was a kid and I saw Moonraker or when I saw The World Is Not Enough. And I left the movie theater, and oh my god, I had a smile on my face. <laughs> when I saw Quantum of Solace, <laughs> I, I needed a prescription for, for tranquilizers. Like, everything is so serious now. Like, I, I'm waiting for the shift back, because it, things ebb and flow, but for some reason, this is just sticking. And it just seems like the more serious we take something, the more art it is. And I don't believe that. At least that's not the way I see art and that's not the way I see entertainment, that's for sure. And it bothers me that this idea is like this disease that's now infected all of Hollywood and it's like, okay, well, you know, we take this, whatever it is, we take, you know, Scooby-Doo, but it's gotta be some important thing, like there's some villain who's gonna blow up the world or something. It's like, no, just, do a Scooby-Doo show. Like, it's about ghosts and kids running around with a dog that talks. I mean, you don't need to overthink this stuff unless you, you have, a, I don't want to say agenda. God, that sounds so at them. It just makes me want to vomit. But I just, it is a mindset that I think has to break eventually. And I, unfortunately, I'm not going to see it because I'm not going to be around long enough to see if this ever breaks. But, I hope it breaks soon because it's really pissing me off and um, eventually it's going to break because it has to, right? Like we can't beat this dire forever. So anyways, okay, here's my, here's my thing. Um, um, sorry. Uh, sorry. Just one quick sec. I lost my train of thought there. Um, okay, first off, let me just touch upon those four films, or sorry, those uh, five shows that I spoke about. And I, I hope that was clear what I was saying. And what I'm essentially saying is I love those shows so much, or those movies so much and show. And yeah, you know what? Lower Decks stands out from everything out there especially with new track but just everything like everything because it's clear to me that mike mcmahon had an agenda and his agenda was to make star trek fun again there's no ridiculous um season-long arc about you know um everyone's gonna die and 
oh my God, oh my God, the stakes are so high. If we don't solve this, it's universal death or whatever. He tells episodic, simple stories like classic Trek has always done and why it succeeds. And you know what? Every time I watch that show, half the time, I have a smile on my face and I think about it the next day in a good way. Um, okay, and I love Discovery and I'm doing a video defending it because I think what Discovery was setting out to do, it's done a really good job. So I'm not gonna bug it for this because I don't think it's a Discovery thing. It's a Hollywood thing right now that somebody needs to change and I think Mike's trying to change it. That's what I think's going on here. But, um, and don't even get me on Picard. The card is, oh, it's a disaster, but um, I'm not even gonna go there because here I'm trying to be positive. So, but Picard's a work in progress and I love Sir Patrick and the potential is so there, but if they wanted my opinion, which I'm sure they want Trekkie Dave's opinion, oh yeah, they might want to just uh, look at what Mike's doing and not look at what Discovery's doing and maybe copy that a little bit. Maybe go, oh, you know, you know, we don't need to be pulling out somebody's eye or cutting them their head off. You know, let, let's do this instead. Let's make a joke about it and it's funny, ha ha. I don't know, that would be my suggestion. Maybe tone it down a bit. You don't always have to be um, ground shakingly edgy um, in order for people to enjoy your product. And that would be my, to all of, all of Hollywood right now. Um, so let me just begin with, okay, you guys already know my position on Moonraker, but I don't think I've ever mentioned the world is not enough, I don't believe. Just so you know, they're, they're my two favorite Bond films, hands freaking down, nothing close. I don't care what anybody says, those two films are the greatest Bond films of all time. They combine everything perfectly. They're cheesy, um, they got the two best Bonds, Bronson, Pierce Bronson, and uh, my favorite, Roger Moore, and they're kind of similar, I think, in style, or at least I've always kind of seen them as similar. I was actually excited when um, Pierce Bronson got the job as Bond, because I know there was controversy over that, whether, you know, Remington Steele, sorry. <coughs> um, sorry, one second. Whether Remington Steele would um, release him and stuff. So that was a celebration day in, in my house when he got that job. I'm like, yeah, because I knew he would nail it. And yeah, he nailed it, like big time. And he was basically a reincarnated Moore, which, pff, beautiful, loved it. So, um, and when Dave, or, or sorry, um, sorry, and his films reflected that. They were basically an extension of the Roger Moore films. So, the world is not enough. I'll just quickly give you my take on this. I wrote something down quickly because I can't remember this just off the top of my head. Okay, so here we go. This is what I think about the world is not enough. Or sorry. Um, um, it's an iconic movie. Bronson taps into his inner more. The action is awesome. Plot story top notch. Jonathan uh, Price is a top-notch Bond villain, one of the best. I still like Drax more, but he is good. It has best action after the Moonraker, okay, uh, movie. Absolutely better than anything we have been given <coughs> in the Craig era, or as I <laughs> like to term it, <laughs> the depressing time, <laughs> sorry. Um, but above all, Moonraker, and um, the world is not enough balanced what I consider to be great Bond films, but at the top of it all. So they're, they have, you know, social commentary. They, they um, do all the things the Craig Bond films do. They just do them lightheartedly or more lightheartedly. Basically, they're fun. That's the gist of it. They're fun. Um, uh, okay. So that's my take on those two films, and that's why they're my favorite Bond films. And oh, do I want to go? I'm going to quickly say something about the Craig films, and then I'll stop there. I might stop the video too, just to take a uh, 
Is there a thing of water here? And I'll just restart it, okay? Just so you're aware, it might be a bit um, like glitchy there, but that's the reason for that. But just so I can get my breath here. So, um, yeah, what do I think about the Daniel Craig Bond films? Well, honestly, if I'm to be honest, and hey, it's Unchained Trekkie Dave today. Um, they've been a disaster. I, I hate them. Um, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I, that's kind of mean. You know what? I thought Casino Royale was okay when it came out. And I actually liked it because I thought, okay, they're tonally changing it away from Bronson. Sure, whatever. I mean, I don't mind having a more Sean Connery. I thought it was a one-off. And after like the like sixth film, I'm like, oh my God. And now it's like, it's coming to an end. All I can say is thank God, because hopefully, uh, hopefully Hollywood watches Trekkie Dave's video and rethinks this whole um, uh, serious stuff and tones it down a bit. That would make me happy. But like I said, I won't be around to see it anyway. So who knows? Um, I'm sure they're just going to continue this because other than Lower Decks, I've seen, and Marvel, which is really weird. When you think about it, because Lower Decks is the best Star Trek we've received, in my opinion, since the original series. And I know that's a crazy comment, but in my opinion, Lower Decks is the best show, Star Trek show, since, since the original series. And Marvel, I mean, I read somewhere that Marvel is the most successful um, franchise in human history or something like that. I'm like, really? I, did, I, I mean, I knew it was good, and I love everything about it, but honestly, I didn't realize it was that good. Or, so obviously, people respond to the positive. Because I don't really see people complaining about positive content. So who are these people making these decisions? It's like, okay, we could follow the one that's really succeeding, or we could follow the dire one. Let's go with the dire one, because it's more important, and we might get an Academy Award. I don't know what's going on there, but... Um, anyways, okay, I'm going to take a quick break here. Sorry about this. Um, and then I'll get my train of thought and just get some water and then I'll uh, start up again. And I hope that works for you guys. Sorry. I know this is kind of an un un unconventional video, um, by Turkey Dave. I usually have my wife here kind of directing me. So a little bit at least kind of like, ah, oh, cut off. You're talking too much. Ah, oh, don't do that. So I don't have that. So, um, hopefully I don't say anything too stupid. So, um, yeah, so break quickly. I'm going to get up, break quickly, and then more to come. Okay, thanks, everybody. Okay, Trekkie Dave back here, and I just took important action to save this podcast. They grabbed a belt. Okay, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> so where did I leave off here? Okay, so I believe that this trend started with Christopher Nolan because... Um, Christopher Nolan did a really interesting take on Batman and what I see with Christopher Nolan is he decided to strip away every fantasy element that had made Batman great for generations and make him super serious. This was not going to be your Batman that you were used to. We were going to make Batman, or he was going to make Batman, um, grounded. And that meant everything from, I don't know, getting rid of the Batmobile and giving him essentially a military tank to giving him a, a cliff jumping suit to, to just everything. Nothing could just be. Basically, he did the polar opposite of what Tim Burton did. Tim Burton with Batman 89 respected the source material. He didn't try to alter it into something completely different. In my opinion, he created the greatest Batman movie because he respected the material. He took what was best about Batman, all the fantastical elements, but he, he grounded it in reality enough, but he also created this fantasy world where at least for me, yeah, I could believe that that dude would dress up as a bat. I think Michael Keaton's portrayal of Batman and Batman 89, I can completely believe in this bizarro comic book world, gothic world, um, with all this weird shit going on, that, yeah, you might dress up as a bat to give you an advantage against crime. Like, can somebody be please explain to me why 
Christopher Nolan's Batman dresses up like a bat? Because all he essentially is, in my opinion, is James Bond running around in a bat suit. Like, he is so grounded in reality that you suck all of the fantasy away. Anyways, I think that began this whole thing. So I'm not blaming Christopher Nolan, but I might be blaming the bean counters that look at that kind of stuff and they're like, oh, well, in quarter four we have this, in quarter five we have this, so let's go with quarter four. I don't know. But to me, they didn't... I think what's happened is Hollywood's been taken over by bean counters and people like Tim Burton and, um, interestingly, Mike McMahon, he stands out, but, um, uh, I don't know, Nicholas Meyer, George Lucas, they're not being listened to anymore. And instead, because movies cost so much money to make and they're so scared of taking a risk, and you get exceptions. I saw The Suicide Squad, James Gunn's Suicide Squad. There's some crazy shit going on in that film. That's an awesome movie. That movie, actually, I could have brought that one up too. I didn't even think of it. Because you know what? That movie's fun. And it is so crazy. Um, it's awesome. But anyways, um, but I think that's what's happened. Is I think that um, they now think, because of you know having a few successes, that that's what people want. And... I know that's not what I want. I don't, so... Um, but you think about, like, Batman 89. Anybody who says Burton didn't understand Batman, they don't understand Batman. I'll take two scenes. Two scenes in Batman 89. And you tell me that these are not both iconic, but don't just say everything about Batman. The opening scene, on top of the roof with the two goons, where he holds him over the thing and he goes... I'm Batman. He jumps off the thing. It sets everything up in that one scene. Batman is a mysterious creature of the night that stalks the underworld. Yeah. The other one, the Axis chemical scene, where Batman is literally stalking the bad guys like he's in a horror film. They're turning around and he's going around the thing and taking them out. It is quintessential. It's the best scene in Batman history. It's quintessential Batman. Anybody who sees that scene and doesn't even realize that that's Batman, and then, you know, I don't know. I, I wasn't a big fan of the Nolan films. To me, the Nolan films aren't Batman films. The Dark Knight was the best one by far. It's a good film. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy it for what it is, but when I go into it, I need to accept in my mind that this isn't really a Batman movie. It's a Martin Scorsese crime um, 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 Godfather type movie or, or Goodfellas type movie. It's not a Batman movie because he stripped all of the Batman elements away. And you know what? It almost got him an Academy Award. And that may be part of this as well, to be honest. I still think there's something going on there where for some reason... Hollywood thinks if you just make it serious, you got a chance. And I don't know. Maybe there's some truth to that, but um, that's not what I want to see in entertainment. So Hollywood needs to change this, and they need to change it now, um, in my opinion. Okay, so that's it. My, that's my rant on Batman. Um, and then the next part I'm going to go into is about Lower Decks specifically. Because there's a lot I want to say about what Lower Decks has struck me and how it nostalgically makes me look back at um, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And more specifically, the way that Mike is delivering Lower Decks reminds me very much of how the great Nicholas Meyer delivered Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan to us. I think they were coming from similar places and they both succeeded beyond expectations. And um, I respect that. So um, I don't want to talk about um, every episode of Lower Decks. Like this isn't going to be some kind of... Here, I'm just going to read for a few minutes. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit tired. But um, <clears throat> I'm just specifically going to concentrate on an episode that just came out recently called Raj Daj, which 
Interestingly enough, is apparently Klingon for three ships. Who knew? Um, apparently, um, a text track knew because I learned that there and I wrote it down because I thought it was so funny. Those guys, by the way, text track, best um, individual reviews out there. Um, but whatever. But I don't do that, so I wouldn't even attempt it. But what they do is great. Okay. So Dej, this is my take. I'm just going to read it to you quickly. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going through a lot of energy here. Um, this is my take on Dej, Wej Dej, Lower Decks episode. Okay. And why, in my opinion, it's not just the best um, Lower Decks episode over its two years, but most impressive for me was its cinematic nature. More than any other episode since the original series, City on the Edge of Forever, this was really a film. The presentation of this episode was cinematic, not a TV show, especially an animated TV show. Everything from the presentation of the stunning visuals, the musical score, the music beats, the writing and dialogue, the shot counts and the setups, the narrative structure, the special effects set pieces, Final battle was so well staged. I loved the Rathacon phaser and weapons visuals and setups. I would actually place this um, battle just behind the Rathacon's iconic battle and definitely better than Nemesis. I can see Mike doing a Trek film in the future. If he follows this basic premise, uh, if, he ba if he follows this basic premise, as Nicholas, as Nicholas Meyer always says, do the basics right and you create an iconic Star Trek film. Write and prepare key scenes and dialogue and acting and the rest will fall into place. Um, one sec, sorry. That's exactly what Mike did with this episode and why this is the best episode. I'm not kidding when I say this, in my opinion. This is the most cinematic thing we've received from Star Trek. And it's an anim animated TV episode since the Wrath of Khan. Um, it has iconic, stunning visuals and music, great writing and dialogue, compelling story beats and moments. This episode transcends Trek TV. It's the best Star Trek cinematic we have received since the Wrath of Khan and the best Star Trek episode since City on the Edge of Forever. That's my take on that episode. And I don't know if you guys know how Nicholas Meyer became involved in Star Trek. It's actually kind of funny because it's kind of the same sort of surprise that I feel with Mike. And what I'm talking about there. So I'm going to quickly do this and then I got to pause again. I just want to pause. This. I don't want this video to be two hours long here. And like I said, I don't have my wife. So, okay. So, um, Nicholas Meyer got involved in Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, as a whim. When I read this, Hart Bennett didn't even really know who he was. And he contacted him, and Nicholas Meyer initially declined. He said he didn't want the job because he knew nothing about Star Trek. And apparently, I can't remember if it was wife or girlfriend, I think it was a friend or somebody he worked with at the time, said to him, you know, Nick, that might be short-sighted. If you don't know anything about Star Trek, do what you always do and make it your own. And he thought about it and he contacted Nick Ma or um, Harv Bennett up and they met at Harv's house. And <laughs> this is a funny story, I love this. But it shows what a great human being um, Nick Meyer is because talk about pressure. He's like, I think he was in his late 20s or something. He's young. And he hadn't really done anything beyond a couple of small films and some Sherlock Holmes um, books and stuff. But he wasn't well known at all. He was a nobody, essentially. Really. I mean, he was. Like, I think like there were people that knew him, but he wasn't like Steven Spielberg or something like that. And what Hard, what hard Bennett did was give him an amount of responsibility over this film that was way beyond his experience in years. He took a gamble, a major gamble, and wow, did it pay off. Okay, so they needed to start shooting. If I, if I remember this correctly, and I read this a long time ago, they needed to start shooting in two weeks, and they didn't have a finished script. 
And, you know, Nick was being Nick and trying to be helpful. And he's like, well, let me look at the scripts. He looks at the scripts. He knows nothing. There's like five of them. He knows nothing about anything about Star Trek. So what they agreed to do is Nicholas Meyer would try to fix the script problem to get something in place so he could actually begin directing in two weeks. So Harvey Bennett and key people involved in the production sat down with a highlighter and they all went through the scripts and they highlighted anything that they liked from the individual scripts. And they like, you know, double star something if they really liked it, like it, it could be anything. A character motivation, a line of dialogue, a whatever. So, um, Nicholas Meyer at his home, in his den, put the scripts out on a thing, highlighted what he wanted, sat down, and literally wrote a script off of that, taking the best elements and completely changing and making his own. So, because he wanted to have the film be fun, imagine that, wow, what, what a revolutionary. So because he wanted to have the film be fun, he decided to add elements that he loved. Like he wanted it to be, you know, set in the future, but be historical. He wanted the characters to actually have faults, you know, and not be, you know, um, so serious. So, um, you know, uh, Kirk would, you know, be getting older and lose his eyesight and, and, um, sorry. And, uh, and he'd bring in swastbuckling and nautical themes because he loved the Napoleonic War, um, uh, Horatio Hornblower's stories from his youth. And he felt like just looking at the highlighted stuff that Kirk had kind of a Hornblower sort of thing, which is interesting because later I read something that Roddenberry heard that and he laughed, which apparently Roddenberry hated. I, I don't understand, but. Roddenberry didn't get along with Nick. I think he just thought he was uppity and young or something. But anyways, um, that apparently when Roddenberry first conceived Kirk, it was actually in his mind that Kirk was um, hornblower-like. So anyways, um, and he delivered the script in the 14 days and Hart Bennett and the executives looked at it and it was so incredible and this is what I read, they stamped it, don't touch, meaning don't alter this script. It became the final version upon them reading it, and that's what was shot. And as the production went on, there's a few funny things that, this is a whole video unto itself, maybe I'll get, well, you know what, maybe I'll get into it. But, um, um, Nicholas Meyer, even at that young age, was such a, a freaking genius that he saw things as the, as the um, film, as he was shooting it, that he noticed. And he would basically slow down production to get what he needed because he knew if he could build the film around say four or five key scenes and get those perfect, he had, it had the potential to be a perfect film. And that's what he did. So one of the things he noticed and I think this goes back maybe to, to uh, the great chef's um, um, television work and stuff. But what he noticed was that Shatner was extremely perfect, um, prepared, extremely professional, but not very flexible. He wasn't good at taking direction from Nick. So what Nick realized after a day of shooting that confrontation between the Reliant and the Enterprise is that Shatner was delivering his dialogue all along. But... If you pissed him off and exhausted him, he'd um, he'd alter his performance. So what Nick and it's it's covered off in the book. I thought it was hilarious. But what Nick would do is okay. The one scene I remember that I thought this was so funny. Um, it's the scene where um, the Enterprise is ordering the Reliance shields down so they can fire on it, and Khan doesn't know what's happening. In Shatner's first hundred takes, no, I'm just kidding. Shatner kept delivering the line, um, here it comes, here it comes, Con, or whatever. And Nick would keep stopping it, and he's like, no, Bill, no, Bill, this is all wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're ruining the scene. Like, listen to what I'm saying. You're dealing with a superhuman here with the highest intelligence. 
if you deliver that line like that, he's going to know something's coming. And he's going to order his guys to raise the shields. you got to act like, like you're just casually saying, yeah, here comes the Genesis information, Khan. You can't deliver it like you're about to fire on, on a ship, right? Shatner just didn't get it. He kept being Shatner, you know, classic um, alpha male thing. So what, I thought this was so funny, what Nick realized is if he just exhausted him by just doing it over and over again, so what should have taken, you know, three takes, he did like 40 on. And by the 40th take, Shatner is belligerent because this punk director he's never heard of is for some reason questioning him. He knows Kirk, like what's, who's this guy? So, but what would happen is Shatner would literally get exhausted and he just wouldn't care anymore. And apparently there's just one take where Shatner just he's rolling his eyes, he looks up, he goes, here it comes. And cut, that's it, you got it. And anyways, he did that over and over again on those key scenes to get the delivery. And that's, I think, pretty funny. I've heard about crap like that before, kind of. I know that um, Kubrick did that with Shelley Duvall, but for completely different reasons. Um, but that's something else. Anyways, um, I've always found that story funny. Um, and I don't think Mike McMahon's doing that with the animation stuff. But um, it's a similar idea where you take something and you make it your own. And that's what I feel Mike McMahon has done. It's clear to me that both Mike McMahon and um, Nicholas Meyer were, um, were doing these things to have a fun um, product. So that was their bottom line and they did whatever, they do whatever they need to do to get there. So if you know, McMahon needs to push the envelope here or there, do something that's maybe, you know, like, I don't know, like <laughs> the naked time scene from, uh, from what, that episode. Oh my God, that was hilarious. I love it when uh, Mariner ejects herself out of, the, uh, out of the airlock to try to get away from all the naked people. <laughs> and before she can clear the thing, they all attach themselves to her. So she's like, she's like being ejected into space with 20 naked people attached to her. Oh my God, that made me laugh. But, um, but similar kind of idea where it's to make the product better. And I don't see that happening in this day and age in anything else. I don't think that the creatives have that control. I think there's too much control by the bean counter saying, no, you can't do that. Other than James Gunn and that crazy movie, I just don't see. Um, and I think back, I think the reason why old films, basically pre 20 years ago, on general, and I'm talking in general, but I think the reason why films back then were so much better is because you actually had a situation where you had somebody like Harvey Bennett with so much risk involved handing you know a pile of scripts over to Nick Nicholas Meyer and saying do whatever you can do and would just live with it there's no way that happens today other than maybe with with Mike McMahon I I don't know Mike McMahon is is I, I don't know how he has the power he has it's so unique but I love it because he is basically like in my opinion like Nicholas Myers saved Trek in 1982. Mike McMahon has saved Trek, or saved as especially. Sorry, Jesus. One sec, sorry, people. Holy cow. <clears throat> Mike McMahon has saved new Trek, especially. Anybody who watches that episode and doesn't have their socks blown up, they have an agenda, fandom menace. They have an agenda to hate it no matter what. Because I cannot believe that a human being with even an ounce of common sense or um, critical thinking can watch that, or the Rathacon for that matter, and not be blown away by the artistry that they're seeing and by the director's voice, or whatever you call that, that they're seeing on the screen. Okay, I've got one last bit I want to do here, so I'm going to pause one more time. I hope that was okay.
Okay, Trekkie Dave here. One last thing I just wanted to say. I hope I got my gist across there on what I'm trying to say. I think I did. And basically, the gist of my video is do what Mike's doing, Hollywood, and bring back the fun. If you want to save Hollywood, that's what I would do because I don't know about you, but that's what I enjoy. And I'm getting tired of, you know, depressing movies, and I'm getting tired of Hollywood inserting that into the franchises that I love, like Star Trek, and like James Bond, and like Batman, and so forth. So honestly, the way forward for you, Hollywood, is to fix this, and fix it now, before it's too late. Okay, and one last thing I wanted to say here, um, um, just real quick. Something that I've noticed with my channel, and I just thought I would mention it, because I think people may be hedging their bet with me or something weird, and I'm not sure why that is. It's just a feeling I have, just because I monitor the channel, like I, I respond to comments and so forth every time somebody does, and I do it in a timely way. But I've noticed this weird, I don't know if I'd call it a trend exactly, but I've been doing this for a month now, and my subscriber count literally hasn't gone up one in a month, even though I've released over 10 videos. I find that odd. So I think people maybe, <laughs> and this video probably isn't gonna help, but I think people maybe don't know quite what to make of me maybe, and they're kind of hedging their bet, kind of seeing what, where this goes. So I just thought I would throw this out to you. Um, this isn't going anywhere. I mean, I think, I think most of you know what's going on with me, with my health and so forth, right? Um, you know, um, I had surgery for my brain tumor and I don't want to get too personal here because, you know, I'm a private person and before I did this, I've never even been on video before and I did, wasn't even comfortable having my picture taken. So this is totally new to me, but I'm getting more familiar with it as we go along. But, you know, um, my prognosis is eight months, eight months. And that's from the date of my surgery. That was in August. So basically we're talking about like March, April, maybe. And just to be clear, this is completely um, variable, right? With the treatment and stuff I'm going through, the treatment isn't gonna save my life. The type of tumor I have, it can't just be cut out. So I'm terminal with zero life, life ex um, survival rate, zero. Uh, that, that's a kick in the balls, but zero. So what that means is they don't know exactly, but right now it's eight months. If what they're hoping is all the treatment I'm going through with radiation and chemo and loss of hair and all the shit that's happening to me, the hope that they have is that perhaps we can extend that to a year or, you know, God forbid, two years. But it's been made very clear to me that that's like pie in the sky kind of thinking, right? If we can get it to a year and a little bit, that's good. So anyways, I'm not here for a long time. So if you're hedging your bet, like, eh, I don't know if I want to subscribe to this guy or not, I don't really know what this is, um, it doesn't cost you anything. Just freaking subscribe. Because you know what? I may not be here tomorrow. And then the channel just ends. Because there's no grand scheme on my part here to monetize this or this becomes a big business or something if, you know, anything like that. Like, that's not what this is about. This is about giving, leaving behind a person's thoughts who's in their mind has thought about all of this stupid, non-important crap like Star Trek. Well, maybe that's, that's kind of harsh, but um, you know what I'm saying. Like, it's about just getting that out there before I can't be here to do that for my kids and to give my kids a represent, a, visual memory of their dad. So if you're even just thinking about it, just hit the freaking subscribe button, like seriously. Because um, I'm not gonna be here long enough either way. And yeah, it would be nice to kind of see that people are actually appreciating the content or I don't know, like today's video, maybe finding it funny or something. But it'd be nice to actually know because I'm not really getting, other than the occasional comment, but I like one of my videos, like I'm not kidding, I'd have to look it up, I think it was the, the channel intro. It has like almost 500 views and like 10 likes. 
And that's where the that's where the subscriber count came from. It was from video one. It hasn't moved since then. So that's another thing. Hit the like. Hit the like. Like if you liked what you saw today, make sure you hit it. Because that also somehow affects my understanding from asking somebody about that. Is there some sort of effect that has on our algorithm? So hit the subscribe. Because you know, it'd be nice before I go that I have more than the same number of subscribers I have currently. And another thing would be um, that I know that you liked it. If I go on there, like I go on to some sites, like I was on one yesterday, they have like a thousand likes. I'm like, holy crap, but they also have like 60,000 subscribers. But my only point is, you know, if I'm entertaining you here at least a little bit, it really is the minimal that you can do. And you know what? It's up to you. But it would make me feel better. So um, that's it. Um, God bless y'all. Um, hopefully today wasn't too uh, um, uh, crazy. And um, I appreciate you guys watching. And like I said, that last jet or that last Jedi one, uh, I got a good one on that. I can't wait to see the reaction to that one. Um, but that will be. I'm just trying to think. Like I've done the script for it. it's all ready to go, but I gotta kind of mill it in my mind. There's a few that will be going on before then. Um, um, so that's a bit of ways actually just thinking about it and um, just today I'm, I'm trained but um, uh, yeah so um, yeah that's it so Trekkie Dave out thanks for uh, thanks for everything guys and, and uh, 